Multivariable Calculus Section 14.1 Vector Fields. And here's a picture that reminds me of maybe a swarm of bees um, being represented by vector, a vector field showing their direction and velocity. Vector field, real world examples. Here's a picture of a vector field that show the wind patterns in the San Francisco Bay on two different days and two different years and two different times. Of course, this would really be three-dimensional. We're just seeing a uh, two-dimensional image. And then we have magnetic fields that can be represented as little vector fields pointing the way of the uh, attraction of the magnet. And here's a uh, picture of the gravitational field of the Earth, although again, it's, it's just a two-dimensional image. It should be three-dimensional. And here's a, a, a vector field image of the Earth's magnetic field. And the vectors, of course, should be little straight arrows, not, not uh, curved. Vector field geometric representation. Here's a two-dimensional example of the vector field f of xy equal xi plus yj. Notice that at each point, then, there's a vector whose length would be the square root of x squared plus y squared. Here's another two-dimensional um, example. This is a generic vector field with just a few little vectors shown instead of infinitely many vectors, which you couldn't draw. And r squared is another name for 2D. Here's a picture in three dimensions, and another name for three dimensions is r cubed. And here are some prettier examples of vector fields drawn by artists. Now, of course, uh, the actual vector field has a vector at every single point in the plane or in three space. And so if you drew all of the vectors, it would look like this, which wouldn't be very helpful. So we just draw a few of them. Vector field definition. A vector field defined on a region T in space is a vector valued function f that associates each point x, y, z in T with a vector. f of x, y, z equals a real valued function times i plus another real valued function times j plus another real valued function times k or in shorthand, we can leave out the i, j, k, and write it this way. And we can also leave out the x, y, z just for our shorthand notation. Now, if you're only in two dimensions, then if the vector field is in the x, y plane only, we drop the third component. And so we have f of x, y equals p of x, y, i plus q of x, y, j, where p and uh, q, again, are real numbered functions. You end up with a real number. And uh, in shorthand, we can drop the x, the y, the i, and the j. The gradient vector field is a special vector field. The gradient vector field is the vector field where f is defined as the gradient vector. And of course, that consists of the partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z, um, respectively, times i, j, and k. Recall that these gradient vectors point in the direction that maximizes the value of the directional derivative. For example, if f of x, y, z is the temperature in space at each point x, y, z, then moving in the direction of the gradient vector field will warm you up faster than moving in any other direction. So if you're ever stuck in space floating around and you see these little vectors pointing, uh, the gradient vectors pointing in a direction of uh, temperature, you want to move along those vectors to warm up. And I'm sure that will be something valuable in your real life. <clears throat> Divergence of a vector field. Given differentiable component functions p, q, and r such that the vector function is equal to those component functions times i, j, and k, the divergence of f is defined as divergence of f equals, now that middle thing is sort of a slang notation, which I'll explain later. It's the last part you need to look at. It's the sum of the three 
um, partial derivatives of the three functions in the direction of those particular unit uh, vectors. So you take the uh, partial derivative of p with respect to x, the partial derivative of q with respect to y, and the partial derivative of r with respect to z, and then add those three partial derivatives together. Now explaining that middle notation is just sort of a way of remembering how to compute it. You can think of it as a dot product of the changes, the partial changes with respect to x, y, and z dotted with the vector valued function. And so it's you're not really multiplying there uh, when you combine those, you're taking the partial derivatives of. So it's it's a little bit of a slang notation that your book uses. So for example, if you've ever seen a lava lamp, there's a liquid movement in that lava la lamp and you could um, model that with uh, various vector fields at different times. And so for example, if your vector valued function is the velocity vector field of a steady liquid flow, then the value of the uh, divergence of uh, f at the point x, y, z will give you the net rate per unit of volume at which the fluid is flowing away from or diverging from that point. Now, of course, if it's a negative value, then that means the, the fluid is going towards that point. Curl of a vector field. Given differentiable component functions, p, q, and r, such that the vector valued function f is pi plus qj plus rk, the curl of f is defined as the cross product of the partial changes in x, y, and z crossed with the vector valued function. And if you um, evaluate that determinant, you get the following formula. Now again, just like in the dot product, the, the notation is actually slang notation because we're not going to multiply. It wouldn't make any sense. We're taking the partial derivative of when we um, go across the diagonals instead of multiplying, as I'll show you in the examples. Here's an example of curl. Example, if f of x, y, z is the velocity vector field of a steady liquid flow, then the value of curl f at the point x, y, z gives the rate of rotation or whirling or curling and the angular velocity of the rotation of at the point um, x, y, z. When you plug in a specific point, you get specific information as to what's going on at that point. Okay, so now we're going to jump right into the problems. Number four says to illustrate the vector field defined by f of xy equal 2i plus xj. This is two-dimensional, so we need a two-dimensional grid. And because we can't draw the vector field at every point, otherwise we just have a black area and we won't be able to see anything, it's up to you to choose um, some good points to represent the vector field well. So I first chose 0, 0, which gives me 2i plus 0j. And in fact, anywhere where x is 0, we're going to get that same vector. So all the way up and down the y-axis, we're going to get a vector pointing to the right two units. Then I chose 1, 1, which gives me 2i plus 1j. It looks like that. And in fact, anywhere where x is 1, we're going to get that same vector. Then I chose negative 2, 1, which gives me 2i minus 2j. And anywhere where x is negative 2, we're going to get that same vector. So then I looked in the solution manual, and here's what their rendition looked like. Kind of gives you a good picture of the flow inside that field. Number six, illustrate the vector field defined by f of x, y equal x squared plus y squared to the negative one half times x, i plus y, j. So again, it's two-dimensional, so here's my two-dimensional grid, and this time I was a little bit more um, organized. So first I picked 1 for x and 0 for y, which gave me i. And uh, this time I'm <coughs> I made my uh, tick marks two units instead of one unit. And then 0, 1 gives me j. 1, 1 gives me, uh, actually 1 over root 2i plus 1 over root 2j but approximately 0.7i plus 0.7j for the sake of drawing it. Then I picked negative 1, 1 and got uh, negative 1 over root 2i plus 1 over root 2j. 
and then 2, negative 2 gives me a 1 over root 2i minus 1 over root 2j. And then negative 2, negative 2, negative 1 over root 2i minus uh, 1 over root 2j. And then finally 0, negative 2 gave me negative j. Can you see why the magnitude is always 1? Well, if you look up here, if you, if you look at this part of the vector without the coefficient, its length would be the square root of x squared plus y squared. And so with the coefficient being 1 over the square root of x squared plus y squared, you always get a length of 1. And here's the, the picture out of the solutions manual. Number 14, match the gradient vector field of f of x, y equal sine of a half uh, y squared minus x squared with the computer generated plot. So um, this is a, a real valued function, but it has a gradient vector field. And one of these supposedly is the match. So first we have to compute the gradient vector, which is the partial derivative with respect to x comma partial derivative with respect to y. And so in each case, the sine goes to cosine. And then um, in the first component, we multiply by negative 2x uh, times a half, a half times negative 2x. So that's just negative x. And then the second one, we multiply by a half times 2y, which is just y. Now, in order to match them, there are various ways you can do this. I decided to look at what happens when y equals plus or minus x, because that means we always get 0 inside the cosine. And so cosine of 0 being 1, we get negative x, uh, y. So for example, along these two lines where y equals um, plus or minus x, at 2, 2, for example, we get the vector negative 2, 2. And at uh, 4, 4, we get the vector negative 4, 4. And at uh, negative 2, negative 2, we get the vector 2, negative 2. And at um, negative 3, 3, we get the vector 3, 3. So looking over at the um, vector fields, I'm not quite sure why the vectors are too short. Um, none of them seem to have the correct length. However, if you inspect closely, there's only one vector field that has them going in the right direction um, along those um, lines, y equal plus or minus x. And that's, can you tell? Can you see it? Do you see it now? That first one. Number 20, compute the divergence and the curl of the vector uh, function given by these three linear components. So the divergence is the dot product of the changes in the partial changes in x, y, and z dotted with the three component functions. But we're not really multiplying. We're taking partial derivative of x with uh, partial derivative with respect to x of p and the partial derivative partial derivative with respect to y of q, etc. So um, if we look at the first component, the, the derivative with respect to x is 2. Second component, the derivative with respect to y is 3. And in the third component, the derivative of uh, that function with respect to z is 7. So we get a number, which kind of makes sense because we've got linear components here. So it makes sense that the dot product would be of the changes of the derivatives would be a, a real number. Now the curl is a little bit more complicated. We are going to do the um, determinant here. And again, we're not really going to be multiplying. We're going to be taking partial derivatives of as we go up and down the diagonals. So here's our um, determinant written out with P, Q, and R in that last row. And we copy the first two columns. And then if we multiply, we're not multiplying, I'm sorry. If we take the derivative, the partial derivatives on the down diagonals, we always get 0 because partial derivative, for example, that first one, partial derivative with respect to y of 7z minus 3x is 0 because there's no y, um, no y uh, term. And then the second diagonal is also 0 and so on. Now when we go up the diagonals, um, the first one, for example, we're not really multiplying. We're taking the partial derivative with respect to y of 2x minus y. And then we're multiplying that times the k vector. So that'll give us negative 1k. Then the second diagonal, the derivative of 3y minus 2z with respect to z is negative 2. So that's negative 2 times i.
And then in the third diagonal, we're taking the partial derivative with respect to x of 7z minus 3x, which is negative 3, and then that's times j. Now remember, it's the bottom values minus the top values, so we end up subtracting those negatives. And our final answer for the curl, then, is 2 comma 3 comma 1. Number 24, compute the divergence and the curl of this vector valued function. And so for the divergence, we are going to do the dot product of the partial changes times the component vector of the function. And so in the first component, we're taking the respect to x, so we get 2x and then keep the e to the negative z. In the second component, we take the derivative of that y cubed, because we're doing it with respect to y, and we get 3y squared, keep the log x. And in the third component, um, the derivative with respect to z is just the coefficient of z, which is hyperbolic cosine of y. And you add those three together, so that's the divergence. Then for the curl, here's our determinant with the partial derivatives along the middle, i, j, and k along the top, and p, q, and r along the bottom. We recopy the first two columns. Now this time, when we multiply up the diagonals, we get 0 because there's no y in the first component, no z in the second component, and no x in the third component. This is really nice of the authors to have a bunch of things turn out to be 0. Don't get used to that. It won't always be 0. And then multiplying down the diagonals, the partial derivative with respect to y of z, hyperbolic cosine of y, is, uh, well, you have to take the uh, derivative of hyperbolic cosine, which is hyperbolic sine, and keep the z. And that's times i. Second diagonal, we're taking the derivative with respect to z, so the e to the negative z becomes negative e to the negative z. And we keep the x squared, and that's times j. And finally, the last diagonal, taking the derivative with respect to x, we keep the y cubed. And then uh, for log x, we have 1 over x, and that's times k. So there's our curl in terms of i, j, and k. So now I leave you with a beautiful rendition of a vector field with the vectors emanating out of a Mobius strip. Enjoy the problems for 14.1 and draw some nice vector fields.